This is the Art of Network Engineering podcast. In this podcast, we'll explore tools, technologies, and talented people. We aim to bring you information that will expand your skill sets and toolbox and share the stories of fellow network engineers. Welcome to This Old Network, a land improvement show where we try to help you by showing you how we build and handle networks. Frankly, it's your choice whether or not you listen to us. In fact, we should probably have a legal disclaimer somewhere. Anyway, have you ever tried to troubleshoot an issue with nothing more than a few pings in your pocket? Perhaps you've spent hours troubleshooting an application when the issue is just a link flapping. We'd better flip that around since we know the issue is rarely the network, Maybe you spent hours digging through route tables when really a certificate had just expired. Hey, we've all been there. You're among friends here. Now grab your console cable and enjoy the show. Very nice. Welcome to the Art of Network Engineering. My name is Andy Laptef. If you care to look, you can find me at permitipandyandy.com. And I am joined tonight by... Rocket girl. <laughs> Lexi, how you doing, Lex? I'm good, Andy. I'm uh, learning a lot about pronunciation of words this week, so. As, a, as an example? <laughs> for, for example, according to 5 million men from TikTok, the <laughs> proper way to pronounce this word is Ethernet. Not, <laughs> not Ethernet. Ethernet. Either or. Ethernet, Ethernet. E- Ethernet, Ether? Ethernet. Either? Either? Is it Ethernet? Now Kith. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Ethernet. That's how you're supposed to pronounce it. So um, I have learned from my mistakes. I realized this was a cardinal sin that I've committed, and I am dedicating my life to <laughs> making it up to the people. I'm so sorry for those whom I have offended. With my pronunciation of this, that very is the most word. sincere apology I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I well, love. I mean it. I love what Pete Lumbus posted. I can't. It, it was a little. You know what I'm talking Which about. One? Which one? It, it, <laughs> it, it was like one. a. It was like a funny video thing. Respond. You know, in response to your pronunciation thing of like. I, I forget what it was about. You know, men having to. Was terror. it well actually? The I think, yeah, 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 yeah. It well started out like, well, man. actually, it was just really, yeah. fu- it was a really funny Are you a take. a man <laughs> who feels the need to correct a woman <laughs> on something she knows more than you about? <laughs> Maybe you should try just fucking not. Yeah, that was <laughs> it, right? I, yeah, I don't remember yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, but that was the, that was the gist of it. No, that that doesn't it. sound yeah, like it, P it was, at all. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like a pharmaceutical commercial but the name of the medicine was like just freaking not or something like it was it was it was great but i love how yeah. you pronounce words lexi i, I like, appreciate like it. i like i shot back at you i have some words that i say pretty funny because of where i'm from so you you, you say you call ethernet whatever the hell you want to call ethernet you know more about Thanks, ethernet Andy. than i do call it whatever the hell you want to i appreciate uh you know what i'm i've changed my mind i've reserved, reversed my position i am not going to change it or make up for any of the sins Excellent. that I've committed in pronunciation I hope you don't. of network terms. I, I <laughs> implore you to please call it Ethernet for the rest of time. I really, really... I will. It'll, you yeah. know, it's already my default, so it shouldn't be too hard to keep doing that. <laughs> uh, well, Lex, I'm sorry that people are giving you a hard time, but keep doing what you're doing. I, I love your content. Appreciate that. Thank you. <sighs> and also tonight... I have Mr. Tim Bertino. How you doing, buddy? Andy, I'm fantastic. You know, everybody, Andy was just giving me shit before we recorded that uh, of my my bright, sunny disposition all the time. So I'm going to fluff it up even more. Andy, I am fantastic. So happy to see you. It's it's nighttime, but I'm pretty sure there's a rainbow outside. <laughs> Things are fantastic. Uh... I, I don't know if you caught it in there, Andy. You were partly uh, the inspiration for that intro. Because you had recently told this us, old house because th- I'm old. I think. Oh shit! Sorry, <laughs> that wasn't even it. Dude, without Dan wow, here, I didn't even to, mean like, to do that. That was awesome. You just bring it up yourself, Andy. 
But we, we had yourself. something uh, we had something in our group chat, I think a few days ago, we were talking about something that you had fought in the past where you were on this huge troubleshooting call for a long time and it ended up just being a uh, an expired oh. certificate. Yeah. That shit yeah. happens, you right? Got, I mean... Dude, hours upon hours. Of, you know, the app people, we're going to get an app person on here and just eviscerate them because... <laughs> I can't tell you how many bridges I've been on with a crap ton of people, and it's not the application. We didn't touch it. Everything's fine. Nothing's broken. It's definitely the network. People can't get to this app. We're losing a million dollars a second. You need to fix your network. What's wrong with you people? Why don't you people, you know, 15 hours later, oh, our certificate was expired. Whoopsie. Sorry. You know, but they don't even tell you that. It'll be like three days later. You're like, whatever happened to that outage thing? They never bothered us about. And like, oh, yeah, their certificate was expired. Sorry, I'm triggered. <laughs> and now that andy's triggered andy how are you <laughs> i was fine till just then <laughs> uh man My job is complete I'm, I'm i'm in a, i'm in a good place tim i'm in a good place in spite of the fact that i quit caffeine about six days ago and i this is news like, to me yeah well i've been quiet about it because i'm trying not to say much while i detox and you know i don't want to say anything stupid to anybody but I am I'm like a hardcore coffee guy because I'm tired, Tim. And uh, <laughs> but if if uh, once or twice a year I get into this migraine thing, I can't get out of which is caffeine induced. So I have to like go cold turkey and it's this ridiculous cycle. So right now I'm off caffeine. Will I stay off of it? Probably not. But um, in spite of in spite of a caffeine detox, I'm I'm really well. Um, I went out to Sunnyvale, California for my first trip to Juniper headquarters uh, a week or two ago. It was fantastic. It's sunny and warm out there every day. There's, you know, um, I got to meet my team in person, which was That's really. Awesome. And, and listen, take this for what you will, but I love being remote and working from home and having that freedom. But man, it felt really good to be together with my team. Um, I don't want to move to California to be with my team. I don't want to drive three hours a day to be with my team, right? Yeah, like true. I used to commute three hours a day to get to my old team in Philly, but it was, it was just really nice. And I'm looking forward to going back out. I was in the lab. We were doing some cool stuff. And um, so that, that was really nice. Um, and I'm decorating the house for Christmas. I got to get up on ladders tomorrow and put a bunch of damn lights up. that <laughs> will look pretty. Careful. Eventually. Careful with that. Got a I used to work on a 28 foot ladder. <laughs> didn't you fall off of one or did I make that up? Jeez. You fell off of one and, and the old yourself. jokes just keep on rolling. <laughs> he was Listen, young as back as, then. As soon as he, you, you, you all need to watch I was never YouTube. young, Lex. <laughs> as soon as Andy started talking an about that, man. Lexi steps back. You bet. You better be careful, Andy. <laughs> You're too old to be doing that for too much longer, Andy. <laughs> oh, Lex. You're lucky I like you. Listen, before we <laughs> jump into this episode, I just want to put out in the universe that I want us to have an in-person meetup next year. I don't okay. know why. I don't know how. I don't think we have the money for it, but I would love <laughs> to see you beautiful people again and try to get together with some fans and have a beverage and a cheeseburger. Dare to so dream. I'm just, put, I'm just yes. putting it out there. I, if any hey, listeners Seattle, are out there that want to help us. Seattle? Yeah, I'm down. It's a beautiful airport. It. <laughs> is that is that the most you've been to Seattle? Is the airport? Yeah. I mean, I I remember. <laughs> I get a text. I get a text from Andy on a random weeknight <laughs> that's like, "Hey, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm at the airport. <laughs> Come hang so, out at the airport. You got like a bar Come somewhere I've never heard of. <laughs> I think I actually did have something, but I was seriously considering it. I just couldn't get out of what I was doing. <laughs> I'm in the lounge, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah did you end up in a lounge damn right i'm like i'm like Which fancy one? fire guy the alaska oh, lounge yeah. or what was it first Whatever. class laptop i think is what they call them <laughs> <laughs> all i know is my whole life i've been sitting at the gate and man you 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 go up to this lounge and it's just like leather <laughs> reclining chairs everywhere every food you could imagine an open bar this D really did you see the picture cappuccino. he took when he went out to california he had like this little like pod he was sitting in. Oh. I'd never seen anything like that before. Wait, what? Oh, that was 
That was in Philly. Yeah. yeah. They have these minute suites. So Philly is such a ghetto airport that they don't have a lounge. And they just put you really, in a little. So you got to go sit in the <laughs> closet by yourself. You think about what you did. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I there's this there are these minute suites that you can go in. And it's basically just a fancy closet that you sit in with a <laughs> with a desk and a sofa. But it was nicer than the gate. Because the gates are yeah. full of crazy people and it smells like urine. So I, it was a yeah. nice closet to hang out in. But, <laughs> but I, I, I digress. Let's talk troubleshooting yeah, tools, you should, Tim. You should, all right, come out of the airport into Seattle sometime. Maybe that's what we'll do next year. <laughs> I'll give you more of a heads up. I'll give you more than an hour lead time. Next Sounds time. good. Sounds good. <laughs> I thought it, I, th- I thought it'd be fun if it was spontaneous. Like, like hey, I'm here. You want to uh, You know, I was... I was almost going to do it, but I had, I could not quite get out of whatever it was I was doing. It sounds like a, a bullshit answer, but I, I don't remember what it was, but I, I remember being like, fuck. It feels <laughs> like a bullshit answer because the text response you know. didn't seem like you were upset about not coming. Well, <laughs> Andy it might have been something better I was doing. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was better than at the air. Anything's better than sitting at the damn airport. Hanging out at the airport. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. Well, never we're all doing Let's go. Good. Network tools. I'm going to check this the chat. episode. Tim, what are we is, talking about? Is a brainchild of our buddy Jordan Villarreal. I found it in our uh, Asana dashboard. We are talking troubleshooting tools this week for, uh, I'll say mainly for network admins, network engineers, but different people could get use out of these. What I wanted to kind of start with was some really low barrier tools that are that are really available to anybody and everybody. And then we can just kind of see where this thing blossoms from there. So let's start with with just kind of our basic troubleshooting commands in different operating systems. And the first thing I wanted to bring up was was uh, we teased it in the intro ping. So there are different uh, operators that you can add to the ping command, and, and I'll specifically talk about routers, um, Cisco routers, Cisco switches in this case is they have the extended ping command and there's different minus T minus T that'll get you going forever. Right. The only one I know. (laughs) That's the only one I know. So uh, on the router side, the, the extended ping command, one of the things I wanted to call out that you can add in there is you can change the default MTU. So if you're troubleshooting an issue and, and you're not sure why traffic isn't going across the link, and you think you suspect that might be an issue, you can in the extended ping, one of the options in there is to to change the MTU. So you can change it from the default 1500, go as high as you can before you stop getting replies. So I, I think that's really been, that can be helpful when you're troubleshooting things, especially across a service provider network when you are kind of suspecting that might be an issue. Question. Yeah. Do you source your pings from like a particular interface or a loopback? Ooh, or does good it question. Thank you. Um, that's actually, <laughs> I think that's in my list somewhere. But I do want to talk about sometimes. that. It does, right? It, it, when, mm-hmm. when we troubleshoot, that ping command is what we go to first a lot of times. So when you're on a router specifically and you have different interfaces, let's say somebody says they don't have connectivity and you go on the router and you ping that device and it replies and you're like, no, you're fine. You're up and running. If you just do a default ping, your router is going to pick the source interface from its routing table. And that's going to be the closest interface to that device. So it's going to ping essentially from the default gateway. If that client can't get off network, can't get off its local network to another client, you're not going to find that issue by just doing the default ping. You would have to source your interface to another interface on the router to see if that client's able to route to you. So yeah, good call out, Andy. Thanks. It, it all depends on what you're troubleshooting. I I think sometimes you go into it wanting to, to source it just so you know the beha- the behavior you're, you're trying to see. Real quick. Do you, do you have quick tangent? Um, do you have a set uh, troubleshooting methodology you go through? Because I don't. And to me, troubleshooting is an art, which when we came up with the art of network engineering, the first thing I thought of was troubleshooting because I've tried to teach troubleshooting to people. 
I've had people teach me troubleshooting. E- even as a cable guy for Comcast, they had a whole divide and conquer. And I like they had all these ways to like, but there was usually 10 ways to do it. And there wasn't one definite way. So do you I guys may, know? Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have one? Yeah. It makes me really excited. Um, because I just did a TikTok. I, on I could this. see it in your eyes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so this won't work for every single situation, obviously. But um, when I was first starting out, knock, break, fix, um, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So I was taught to start at the bottom of the OSI model yeah. and move up. So start with layer one. So we'd start with like, OK, well, can you ping it? Right. <laughs> if you can't ping it from where you're supposed to be able to ping it which could be different places, right? Like, you know, ask the data center tech, hey, is this plugged in? Maybe the link is actually electrically not even up and there's something wrong with the cable or the SFP or whatever, right? So start with layer one, then move up to layer two. You know, is there STP involved, I guess? Things like that. Like, is is there a weird, like, is there a broadcast store? I don't know. You know, certain different, different things going on, then move up to layer three and so on. We rarely ever get up to like layer seven but when it's not actually the network that's causing the issue i guess that's when you're up there i have spent an inordinate amount of time (laughs) troubleshooting things it's such a complexity that wound up being a physical problem it's got to be this or Mm -hmm. what's this protocol doing this looks like a software Mm -hmm. bug like just jumping to these silly conclusions respect the physical end for sure Mm -hmm. and i remember in the ccna they i don't know if it's true but they taught my experience proves it out that something like 60 to 70 percent of all network issues start are the physical layer the physical stuff it's what they taught me and you should you should start there you set up to layer seven lex i I wanted to well tim do you do you have a standard troubleshooting methodology before we jump back i I do the same thing and i i think maybe when people hear that follow the osi layer they they may think oh that's just overly complex i have to think about all these things but really we're not saying you have to sit down and make sure you write all this out. I make sure I check this, that, and the other for the physical layer. And then I go up a layer and check this, that, and the other. It's really, after you do it, go through it multiple times, troubleshoot things over time, that stuff is, it's just going to become a quick thought where you think, okay, we just want to make sure we got physical connectivity. Yes, somebody sees a blinking light or you're on a switch and you can see the ports connected, that kind of thing. And you just go through it quickly. So yeah, I follow the same thing, and I do got to say, Lexi, I think you need to follow uh, Jordan's uh, chat comment here. I, you need to do a video where you call it the OC model the OC. and see who you trigger. <laughs> I thought really hard the, about the that. The OC model. I, 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 I agree with that 100%. Uh, the OSI model is is damn near perfect for troubleshooting. Again, you don't have to follow it to a T. It just structures it to where you won't forget things that you should check. So for the new people listening, can we just walk up the stack real quick, maybe up to layer four? So layer one, I'm glad you were talking about blinking lights and stuff, Tim, right? So if you can see it, see the lights, great. If all the lights are yellow on the switch, maybe you got a spanning tree loop, whatever, but look at the physical first. Also, remotely, I would just do a show interface, right, to see if I'm up, 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 down, down, down. I, I've I've had a lot of up, down stuff that was like a, a unidirectional fiber break, and there was traffic getting black hole. Like status, yeah. Show interface status. You can look for like, CRC errors, right? That's like physical-ish, mm-hmm. right? If there's a physical problem, you probably have the cyclical redundancy check errors. So there's a lot to check there at layer one. Layer two, what? Show MAC address, right? Like, the hell's happening at layer two? If your physical's up, check layer two, right? Yeah, Mac address, um, is that it? check your forwarding table, honestly. Are you an ARP entry? It depends on like how, yeah. you know, how appropriate that is to your network topology and what's supposed to be going yeah. on there. But yeah, check your forwarding table. Make sure you have valid ARP entries for whatever you need. And that can bridge you over to layer three then, right? Right. I like how Lexi framed it originally when you're going into something that you're just trying to see if you have connectivity to something you you start with a ping because you know if you get a, a ping reply that tests layers one two and three right off the bat in one command so if you don't get replies then you know immediately you can jump down into layer one layer two but at least you're not starting with i need to dig into why this application isn't working and you're completely bypassing 
um, physical layer routing, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I think while ping doesn't necessarily start you at layer one, it, it's a quick test to see if you need to check layer one, layer two or not. And it can also narrow down, again, depending on your topology, what's going on, it can narrow down the section of your network where the problem is, right? When I was working um, my last job, we had like global activity, right? Like this enormous network. So like something in Singapore, like somebody's server or whatever, can't reach somebody's server in like Germany. Okay, <laughs> well, there's like, there's like a whole distribution and, you know, core network going on in between those two servers or like multiple ones. So you want to paint like does first server, can it ping its default gateway? All right. Can the other server ping its default gateway and move up slowly, like into where they meet in the middle and you slowly get more complex too. Cause you're getting into like from, from the layer two part of it, maybe to more layer three and like MPLS weird stuff and all that going on. So you start, it helps you start, with the least complex thing a lot of the time, move into more complex. And you're also along the way, like narrowing down, you know, where the issue could be. And then once you've sort of find a section of the network to narrow it down to, you can then maybe start at your OSI, you know, lower layers and move up a little bit. It's just like a way to, you, you don't want to go too crazy and wild and all over the place and forget where you started, right? So it's a good way to organize your thoughts as well. So I just want to go layer three, four real quick. And Lex, I think you hit on that, right? Like, and it depends on the environment. If if you're at an edge, you know, router at a client site, it's might be different things than your, cause I was a WAN guy in a data yeah. center. Like my physical's yeah. probably fine. Cause the whole world would be on fire if, <laughs> if my physical stuff was down in my yeah. data center. Right. So what I would do is I would usually go on my distribution layer when something was broken and look for the routes to the source and desk, try to ping them like, okay, great. But then the source ping comes into play and all that. And, and that was just the bare minimum, but I want to talk about layer four <laughs> because I can't tell you how many times it's something I'm kind of blissfully unaware of. I'm not really good at layer four. That was a firewall problem that other people managed, but when an application connectivity is fine up to layer three, but a port isn't open through a firewall, but how do you test that? And I remember somebody showed me, was it like Telnet? Can you open a specific I, port through a Telnet or I, something like that? That's you know I'm talking uh, about? like third on my list. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> I did want to frame that um, because I wanted to oh, bring okay. up Telnet and and say no, not for connecting to devices, but for doing just what Andy said. Um, there's a, I mean, we always get blamed, the network, the firewall, whatever for, hey, you're you're blocking this port. This isn't allowed through, and that's one of the first things that that I'll do is I'll open up a command prompt and just do Telnet space the the host name or the IP address of the the device space the port that they're saying is blocked and you know that once you hit enter if you get something that's not an error right if you get should get an just open, like a blank right? screen or just some gibberish letters whatever you know the device is open and answering on that port you can say right away yep uh -oh. the the device the destination is open on that port. It's listening. It's answering. It's just not configured correctly for what you're trying to do. I did not know that. It's a good That's one. Really it's fantastic. Cool. Yeah. What if is your it network about allows Telnet? Telnet. <laughs> Cause yeah, what is well, it yeah. about Telnet? In a lot do you of know places. what allows it to do that? Like, why wouldn't you use, I don't know, SSH to do that? We'd have to ask smarter people. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just going <laughs> to speculate. Sorry, didn't mean to put you on no, the spot. I, no, I don't know. I, I'm just speculating. I'm looking in the chat un, to see if anybody knows in there. And you're oh, just telling it, it to function on a different port. It's just a way to oh, connect. Oh, because Telnet is, let's see, Dave is saying clean TCP text-based, no crypto. So yeah, what does that mean, Jordan? It's, it's just historically there. just there. It's magic. <laughs> what does that mean? We used to use Telnet to troubleshoot up the layer four. And then the environment I worked in shut Telnet down everywhere on everything. And I'm like, oh, I guess we're not. We'll just escalate the firewall now for layer four <laughs> stuff. So sorry, Tim. I didn't, I didn't want to take us down the rabbit hole, but I thought it's important to, because it's a troubleshooting. Oh, episode, I love the troubleshooting stack. I mean, we're talking about yeah, tools. I, I love that we're framing it up with walking through the the stack to to get us from point A to point B when it comes to troubleshooting. So ping, Telnet. I have one that isn't a tool I'd like to mention, the logs. The logs. So yeah. when so 
checking the logs. I know it's yeah. not a tool, but it's a source of data you can share. I'm just thinking of things I used to use in troubleshooting. You know, something's Blunk. broken. Somebody's comploding. I mean, yes, yeah, Splunk is great, right? But trying to mm-hmm. correlate times too, like this customer couldn't connect from meow to meow, and then I could check my logs. And if I can do a time correlation of like, aha, you know, these tunnels went down at the same time they couldn't get in. And but sometimes it's really hard, especially in a complex network. Like, I mean, there's oh, so and, many things. And in those situations, NTP saves break. lives. I mean, yeah, got to yeah. make sure NTP better be right. on the same time. Yeah. But I, well, I always to- checked. I used to do, so I didn't have a really standardized methodology troubleshooting. When I was new, Lex, like you were talking about in the knock, I'd be terrified. And what I just type over and over again to show IP interface brief, show IP interface brief. <laughs> I just, I would just type one or two commands I know to like, just get your like, right. down. Let, yeah. me, let uh, me check again. Show logging, type, include, <laughs> right, right. Uh, Ethernet 3. So it, <laughs> yeah, it was know. show IP interface brief, show log, you know, and then maybe a show ver to see if it rebooted. <laughs> like, but yeah, right, show log, show there's, <laughs> there's a lot of data in there um, in, in the log. I know it's not a tool necessarily, but people, I, I would come into a troubleshooting expedition and nobody had looked in the logs and I was able to find, you know, I could correlate some time. I could correlate events in my network on devices to times things happen. You know, if somebody said the WAN was down for an hour and I look and I'm seeing, you know, the, the logs, I mean, the, the device should tell you if you have your logging set up right, if something bad is happening. Yeah, but you got to have your logging set up right. Yeah. Well, you do. And you're, you're we're talking in the chat about time zones. Ooh. Yeah. That can be Hopefully tough. you're all running the same Everything should be UTC. UTC, right? yeah. Everything should be yeah. UTC. It isn't anywhere, but <laughs> it makes it easy. <laughs> it isn't anywhere. I want to call um, that out, though, Andy. You talked about looking at logs, and we were talking about the different layers of the OSI model as we go and troubleshoot. And really, looking at logs can apply to every single layer as you go through that step. You know, it doesn't really belong to any given one. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's important. Um, going down kind of the, the ping vein, I wanted to bring out uh, trace route. So mm-hmm. trace route, basically just leveraging ICMP um, with different TTLs to show you the path that a packet's taking. Has anybody noticed just using default trace route, like in Windows, how incredibly slow it is to go through each hop? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I'm trying to think. So what what that is, why it takes so much time each hop is by default, trace route is going to be doing a reverse DNS lookup at every hop to try to show you a name for what that IP address belongs to or maps to from a DNS perspective. In Windows, if you do the tracert or trace RT. I don't know, Lexi, you get shit all the time for pronouncing things do, apparently do the very way. incorrectly. Tracer. So, Tracer. yeah, so I don't know if I'm saying that right. So hopefully I take some of I that pressure off either. of you this week. Um, <laughs> Thanks. We'll just say Tracer. So if you do in Windows, if you do a Tracer space minus D delta for DNS and then space your host name, IP address, whatever, it will skip that DNS lookup process. So your trace routes, if you don't care what the name of every hop is. You just want to see what IPs it's hopping through as it goes through the network. That minus D will disable that DNS lookup. So it'll just go a lot faster than it would if it had to do the DNS lookups. So I wanted to call that one out. Which command gives you the response time? Is it tracer out or ping? Because I know like if if you're having a latency issue, you can find the hop. Like, you know, everything's... Okay, because yeah. I've used that too. Like every hop's like ten or fifteen milliseconds. And yeah, trace route like four thousand yeah. milliseconds. You're like, let's look there. Something seems funny there, right? Yeah, there's even a, an application built off of that. I think it's called like Ping Plotter. I don't know if anybody's used that before, but it's like a shows you a graphical representation of. It's basically a a graph of a trace route. If you're trying to see latency from point A to point B, it'll plot that out for you. Pun intended. That's really cool. Now we're getting into like app territory yeah. because I remember using a few different things at previous jobs um, that were built that were supposed to be like all in one network monitoring tools and troubleshooting tools. And some of the functionalities included like you can ping using this exact same 
Like, you don't have to go anywhere to ping. You can just ping from the web interface or whatever and, uh, you know, do a trace route and lookups and stuff. All from here. So easy. So simple. Why would you ever use anything else? <laughs> and uh, that can be good. And it can be not so good as well. So in talking about DNS, I, I did want to bring up a couple of tools, both NS Lookup and Dig, depending if you're Windows or, or Linux. I've got more experience on the NS Lookup side, so I'll talk through that a little bit. And really what that is, is it's it's just a way to look up different DNS records and you can point to different servers. So a couple of use cases are if you're creating DNS records, for instance, you, you're you creating public-facing DNS records on your local DNS server that's going to propagate out to the world, you may want to check different DNS servers out in the world to see if they've received those record updates yet. So you can run NSLOOKUP or DIG, point to um, any server you want. One that I use often is just 8.8.8.8 because I know it's a DNS server out on the internet. And you just put in the, the records you want to look up and it'll return uh, the answer. By default, it's going to look at uh, A and quad A records, so IPv4, IPv6, DNS. But you can change the record type too. One that I've used in the past is changing the type to the SOA or the start of authority record. And the reason behind that is so you can see for the record you're looking up, the domain name you're looking up, you can see what server on the internet is authoritative for that. And a use case for that is, let's say you've got uh, a firewall and you're doing geo blocking and all of a sudden people start looking up, uh, trying to go to a website and their DNS lookup is just returning nothing. You can look up the start of authority record to find that authoritative DNS record with an NS lookup or a dig. And then you can take that IP address and look in your firewall logs to see what is it doing with that. And that's just kind of a, a quick way to try to get to the bottom of something like that. So different bunch of different use cases for, for using things like NS lookup and dig. That's amazing, Tim. You, you're, you're earning that architect money, buddy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's a bunch of stuff. I don't know anything about. I am embarrassed yeah. to say I have never had a DNS problem in networking. I know everybody's like, it's DNS and it You've must never be lived, in- man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I've broken it at home because I was doing nefarious things and I forgot to change it back, but like, <laughs> Yeah, I've I've never like had DNS burn me abroad. Well, I've only had one DNS problem to deal with in my entire life. So I'm I'm close to you, I guess, Andy. You're better than me, Lex. It's okay. I mean I we we could do uh not well not me. <laughs> I think we need to get an SME, but I think a, a deep dive on on DNS and the distributed environment and how it yeah. really works. The whole recursive set up and everything. I think an episode on that would be yeah. good. Maybe boring I, as I hell, remember, but <laughs> might be good. I don't okay. know. It's I remember studying it for maybe CCNA, maybe Encore. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. But um like that that knowledge I don't use day to day, so I've lost a lot of it. So it'd be a great refresher in my opinion for well there you go Andy everybody. Andy. Andre just face. said it in the chat. You've been looking for a way to uh quote use Russ White on this show. You can explain DNS to everybody. <laughs> I had a really cool topic for Russ. Yes. So you gave me a, yes, we will have Russ on. Um, <laughs> he has, he has agreed. So DNS is something I would not want to talk about. And you gave me another idea for a good episode that I wouldn't want to talk about is V6, IPV6. We, we have to have, so there's a couple people I love trolling on Twitter <laughs> And telling them how useless V6 is and how network's fine and we don't need it. And they get so butthurt and upset and start yelling at me. Like, they'll yell for three hours if I just, like, <laughs> throw a little nugget out there about, like, V6 is dumb. So I think we should have, we'll have a DNS episode for sure. And then I think we should have a V6 episode as well. But I think we should bring on a couple people that are V6 experts, like Smeeze, so sure. that we can cut. Ki- it's almost like bringing the app owners on to yell at them. Like, I think we should bring the V6 people on to be like, all right, dude, give me your pitch. It's been 20 years. Nobody cares. We're at 30% I'm on global with, adoption. Like, I'm on board you know with I mean? V6. They don't have to pitch to me. It's I'll dumb see. as shit. We don't need it. It's not dumb. 
very useful. I've seen one use case for it that made any sense in my 14 years of networking. One. The fact V4 that IPv4 is working fine. Is just over isn't the use case that makes sense. The world is running on V4 and we NAT everything and we don't need the addressing for six. That is an argument. <laughs> it's how every... <laughs> It's how every global network I've ever worked on runs. The only use case I've seen is when two companies merge with overlapping IPs. Well, now you're screwed because now you're double netting stuff to try to get two company <laughs> networks talking together. So if you go to V6, that solves it all. Beyond that, V4 is fine. I, Sorry. I think, the big, I think the biggest thing I've seen, Andy, is what Dave's saying in the chat is uh, mobile networks. So cell networks. Every phone has a public IP address on a cell network. I think that's, that's probably the biggest use case I have seen. Why but does every phone I, have a public address? Every yeah, client that ever connected to my data center, we now had to do a private. So it didn't matter what they were coming. Right. But a phone we, on we a phone them. on a carrier network, like a Verizon, like an AT&T, you're going to have so it's that the sheer number address. of devices, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what exactly. they say, like IOT, yeah. and there's just not enough. IOT has ruined IPv4, just like millennials have ruined so many things. <laughs> V6 <laughs> is so critical to the infrastructure of the internet that we're at 30% global adoption 22 years after the protocol was released in the wild. And the, and the shit's working fine. Sorry, let's let's move on. <laughs> this will be a future yeah, episode. About tools, Andy. I haven't <laughs> been on my I haven't been on my soapbox in a while. Tim triggered me. Although actually tying a little bit of IPv6 into, I have seen issues in the past where like a device is reachable over v4 but not v6, and it's cool to be able to tell that easily by just specifying that in extended ping. You can say mm. ping it IPv4 or ping it IPv IPv6. Oh, nice. And that's an easy way to tell whether or not there's something that only affects IPv6, believe it or not. Uh, not because of anything inherent in the protocol itself, but just like something might be set up all janky on the V6 side that's not on the V4 side. Because, you know, like many of the network engineers who did it perhaps were afraid of V6 and didn't check I'll, all their shit. I will also completely it. backpedal everything I just said and say that when I was studying for the MP and V6 was a required chapter... The shit was fascinating. Like, it's amazing what they did. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Just hex, guys. Don't be afraid of it. It's just hex. <laughs> just zeros Everyone and ones, bro. Everyone is afraid bro. of hex. Everyone is afraid of hex. That is something I yeah. have learned in my time I am the as a network engineer. <laughs> hex is very cool. We can't very even cool. remember IP addresses, so we need DNS. Now you want me to remember b a bajillion character long hex address? Like, I just can't. Nah, I do mean, it. that has My to be managed. But it. you know what I really <laughs> like about. <laughs> yeah, this is becoming IPv6. Hey, Cisco textbooks, Cisco Press textbooks, they will have like hilarious MAC addresses and IPv6 addresses in hex. Yeah, the, and the I just, dead I beef. Really, That's a good one. Yeah, dead beef. I love it. Anyway, enough of that. All right. Where are we going after NS lookup? Does anybody do any of you? That was kind of the major host operating system tools that I wanted to cover. Is it, do any of you have any that come top of mind? That's just something in either a, a guest operating system or router commands or, or just something that you think is it really helpful, but not maybe top of mind for a lot of people? Absolutely. But Lexi can go first because I'm a gentleman. Well, I'm, I was just going to say, <laughs> I have some software in my mind that I've used before. The, you know, efficacy of it, you know, varies, but, um, I'm like right now <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to speak out of turn about vendors and things, but, um, I'm mostly on the hardware side or I'm very much into layer one right now. So a lot of my stuff is actually like physical tools that I was going to talk about. So before we maybe pivot a little bit to that. Sure. Happy to open it up. To like an oscilloscope? Oh, yeah. That's one of them. That's a tool. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. a tool. <laughs> All right. Let's go to Andy. Give it, Give us something that's operating system or router or whatever. And then we'll jump into some, some L1 stuff that Lexi can drop some knowledge on us. Cool. So my favorite troubleshooting tool. Well, let me back up. And I can't believe we haven't said Wireshark yet. But I wish, yeah, it's probably Lexus. So I won't steal the thunder, but I will say that I wish I it's spent not, the time. You can talk about it. 
I don't know anything about it. So other than what Chris Greer told us, so you can oh. talk about it. Okay. But what I learned from Chris and what I've heard forever, and and when I was talking earlier about a standardized troubleshooting methodology, when the heavy hitters would come into those outage calls after we were fumbling for hours, they knew what they were doing. They had a thing they did at every single thing. They were calm. They weren't feeding into the chaos on the call and the people, oh, you know, they were super chill, knew what to look for, blah, blah, blah. But they'd always do a packet capture. Packets don't lie. And 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 that would give you the, you know, the problem. So I, I wish Wireshark is a tool and it's still not too late. And Chris got me excited. So I'm going to try to run a capture at home. But that's not the one I was thinking of because the only one I felt I had in prod that was worth any salt was NetFlow because I worked... In the WAN, so I was a transit network. Customers would come in through the, you know, they, they, they would come in and out of my data center. And when something would break, it was always some IP can't reach some other IP. So I'd get the source, I'd get the destination, If even if they were prefixes, like it might be, you know, this block can't talk to this block, but people can't get to applications. And, you know, you check your routing and that's usually there. And the only way I could figure out to prove out my transit network was to look at NetFlow because NetFlow will give you the source IP, the source IP, the destination IP, and the protocol that it came in through on your ingress and on your egress. So I could say, hey, your traffic <laughs> came in this IP, this source port. Is that the one you sent? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. That was yours. <laughs> and it came in. The, and then look over here. Oh, look. It, it left on this one. So my transit network passed your traffic, which is what I know you're telling me my transit network's broken. And I did a whole, I, I did a whole like 15 minute thing on YouTube about NetFlow and I built a lab and all that stuff to show you the table and all, but NetFlow is magical. It's amazing. And you can also leverage collectors. We had CA performance manager, performance center, whatever the hell it's called, CA suite. But so you could look at historical, like, Hey, a customer said their stuff didn't work two weeks ago. So you could go in and look at it and it would give you the graphical stuff. It gives you top talkers, right? Like who are the most busy talker things on there. But I love NetFlow because it was up to layer four, kind of like what we talked about earlier. Um, you know, source destination IP protocol and the and the the device would tell you, yes, this thing left my interface. Like it wasn't sitting in my buffer. Like this thing's gone. Um, so anyway, that's that's the only thing I wanted to say is I love NetFlow because usually my routes were there and usually I could ping them, but NetFlow was the only thing I had at my disposal because I didn't know Wireshark to prove that that stuff entered my network, exited my network, and you need to go bother somebody else, bro. So, I love yeah, that's NetFlow. a good one for sure for not only troubleshooting, but can also be ingested by that data can be ingested by security tools as well for investigations, looking at, at traffic flows, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's a definitely a multi use. Multi-use tool. Good I think the be I think the best tools are the ones that you can say it's not the network, right? Yeah. And NetFlow, oh, yeah. Was, NetFlow was one of them. Like, yo, yeah. your stuff left my network. It entered here. It went out there. Do you want to see? I'll show you the CLI. You want like you want to see a pretty great for the picture? Like, but it was slow, very Andrew. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, that is another issue. If it's slow, it still could be the network. Could be. Never know. <laughs> what, do you, what do you got <laughs> what do you got lex i was gonna say netflow sounds awesome i like the tools that very quickly can tell you whether or not it is the network because if it's not then you can move on with your day and if it is you can move on to troubleshooting very quickly you know but i've never used netflow so i will send you a I'll link to that. my super awesome yeah. happy fun time YouTube i will watch your video that sounds great thing no you <laughs> won't do i need to put it on I tiktok will. to get your attention that would be cool, but no, I will watch it. I'm on YouTube too, man. Gen X don't do TikTok, man. <laughs> <laughs> Grunge forever. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so up? old, Andy. Experienced, um, babe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whoever's editing this episode just cut out like most of that. <laughs> Even the NetFlow part? I'm really sorry. <laughs> no. what tools you got lex you're gonna talk about wireshark fucking yeah so wireshark is badass i will never say <laughs> it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> listen it up shepherds gerund <laughs> participle whatever yeah um 
Wireshark is the coolest. Um, the only complaint that I could ever have about Wireshark is that I don't know how to write like custom plugins for it. And I wish I could just snap my fingers and have all of the custom plugins. That well, do I you want. need them? Because Chris made it seem like everything's there. Really. Uh, I, well, you're working I on like sometimes. super fancy special stuff. When right? you're working like, on you stupid, need? silly shit, you yeah. do. And when you're working okay. on shit that most people don't do on their networks, you probably right, right. do also. Gotcha. But no, for the most part, yeah, Wireshark has pretty much anything you could dream about. So it's really great. Um, I use it all the time, constantly, forever. And if you have an issue on your network, if you can take a PCAP um, on the device you're on or whatever, you know, I, I, various different ways you can connect up and take a packet capture. Um, it's extremely, extremely useful to throw that into Wireshark. And if, you, you know, Wireshark gives you a lot of options to like, you can have little profiles for, you know, like one profile for like, I'm troubleshooting this part of the network and another profile for like, you know, some software dev like said some shit and like, it's probably not the network, but I'm, you know, looking for some other stuff. And in those profiles, you can like customize coloring rules and the different columns of information that you have that show up and how it shows up too. You can also filter by like certain IP addresses. You can create little buttons that will filter by like protocol IP, whatever you want. Um, and have that all contained within like specific little profiles that you can switch back and forth between. And it's just a really, really handy once you have it all set up. It's it's so easy basically to just like eyeball exactly what you need to see. Or you know exactly what you're not seeing, which tells you other information, right? So it's a very good like at a glance troubleshooting tool once you're able to set that up. Um, I have like a profile for one lab and a profile for another lab where like I'm looking for certain things in one and I'm looking for other things in another one um, and everything is different between them. But I can switch back and forth and I have the coloring rules so that they like pop out at me and it's very obvious like I want to see these IPs showing up. Are they there or not? It's very obvious. Wow, Wire that's Shark hardcore. Awesome. It's uh, it's just so extremely useful. Um and depending on like the kind of hardware that you're using for networking stuff, sometimes you have more or less visibility into it. And so if you can hook up Wireshark, that gives you a lot more than what you might have had before. Um, another thing that gives you visibility, more visibility than maybe anyone would ever want potentially is an oscilloscope. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah, can I'm you not talk about that? Like, yes, I, I've, I've, I've never yeah. heard anybody using I, an oscilloscope. Every time in the that, that of gets networking. brought up, I, I need people to explain it to me again. So. Let Give me tell you, lesson. all I understand is that Lex is measuring pulses of electricity that apparently are auto negotiation. And she gets really pissed off when you turn off auto neg and it still sends the pulses. Or if you turn off auto neg and it stops sending the pulses because everybody else sends the pulses. And why doesn't this one send the pulses? <laughs> I mean, you've, you've, you've discovered that auto neg is really not a standard that's deployed normally across stuff, right? Well, I won't get too deep into it, but. I got obsessed with Ethernet not too long ago for reasons that it doesn't matter. I went way too far down the rabbit hole than anyone ever should ever <laughs> want or need to go. It was just because of curiosity. Um, and looking into a thousand base T specifically, which is what everyone knows as like copper wire gigabit Ethernet, the one that's most commonly deployed today. Um, when you look at how auto negotiation happens basically the way auto negotiation occurs with ethernet you have what's called link pulses that each device sends each link partner as we call them sends to the other one and they send these initial ones that advertise their like abilities speed duplex etc and the you know they'll essentially have a little conversation negotiate with those Question. pulses is that like yeah. a frame like is it a source destination no. mac or right they're actual bad. It's there's if you look at the 802.3 standard, it is specified exactly what those bits are mm. and how far apart they're spaced and how okay. big the entire pulse is. Well, it's um, not but a they're frame essentially coming out of the switch. It's like a separate. No, frame. it's not yeah, like yeah. a layer two thing. It is okay. a layer. Gotcha. It's it's pulses. So, but they wow. represent bits wow. that mean something. And so, depending on if it's a hundred base TX or a thousand base T, which are both are fast E and gigabit like popper standards that everybody sort of knows they actually have slightly different information in them um, and they're sent slightly differently. And so if you can actually, with an oscilloscope, 
hook that thing up to a switch or whatever. And if auto negotiation is enabled on the um, port, you will actually see the fast link pulses in the exact pattern that they are supposed to be in. Cause it's a stand, it's a standardized thing that's laid you can out. Look up the in, standard RFC or whatever it is. And it'll tell you what they should you be. You can literally, I have a, like an oscilloscope screenshot of fast link pulses and you can literally just copy paste. Like you can, you know, overlay it on top of the standard. Question, and it's how do you exactly. connect an oscilloscope to an ethernet port? Is there like a connector? So no. So, well, it has its own connectors, but it's got, and I am not an EE. Okay. So I apologize to everyone listening to this. None of us um, are here. <laughs> I, yeah, but some, some, somebody out there is for sure. <laughs> Listen to another like, show. Singing, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm not an EE. So all of this came from like trial and error and learning from people who know way more than me. But basically we have what four pairs on like your typical cat five, six, whatever cable. So what you actually have to do is what my setup at least is cut that thing in half and then split out the wire pairs. And then I actually got assistance with this at work, right? Like I had somebody actually with the ability to do this, put these little like metal nubs on the end, on the ends of each like wire pair. Okay. So with the oscilloscope, you can take, you have like a grounding clamp and then you have like a little hook and you, I forget which one now, one of the, either the striped pair gets one of them, Mm. And the solid pair gets the other like one. Like gator clips or whatever? Like something yeah, gator clips clip on. for the grounding. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you, you hook it up. And really, for my purposes, I only really, if you if you need to look at gigabit, like really intensely, you need other special equipment. But if I just want to look at the fast link pulses, I can still see them just looking at the orange and the green pair. Can you tell so us why you were looking at fast link pulses? Were you troubleshooting something? It it came from it has nothing really to do with what I do at work. All it has to yeah. do with is that I was using Ethernet for something a, a like eight months ago, and then I went down an insane rabbit hole of, wait a minute, if I try to turn off auto negotiation on a switch, I don't think it's actually turning it off, right. is it? And then I realized somehow someone probably told me you can look at it with an oscilloscope, you can yeah, see yeah. the pulses. An oscilloscope is very cool. You can't look at literally everything. What it does is it measures, you know, voltage. It measures the electrical currents on a wire, and that's it. And you have to be very careful. With an Ethernet cable, it's fine. You're not going to, like, screw anything up. But you got to be very careful when you just, like, clamp it onto anything, right? Because you can short stuff out. So be careful with them. But Did if you, you have the opportunity anything? to learn, <laughs> no. Because I haven't, I haven't touched anything but Ethernet cables. That's it. So... Um, but yeah, it's an interesting tool and it's very cool for at least that one use case that I have. <laughs> Do we have anything else on troubleshooting tools thing we I, left out? I'm just, I'm researching quickly how to jumpstart a car with an ethernet cable. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend making your own cables if you haven't. You're amazed. You talk about the art of network engineering and the art of troubleshooting, you know, the art of trying to, and not not the not the cheat ones where you push it all through, and I, I've seen those like the actual old school ones because all the all all four pair have to be the exact length and the right length. So when you push it in, the jacketing gets caught in that little whatever you call it, the arrestor that keeps everything in. And it it took me a long time as a cable guy to get Ethernet right. It's and a very it's a very own. satisfying feeling though to do that. I mean, w once you can feel your fingers again. <laughs> and you you actually test that cable and get the pass. I mean that that's pretty cool. It's the whole Tom Hanks thing in in Castaway when he makes the fire and he, look at what you know I've how created. I test mine. I plug them in, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool works. No, I I don't really have anything else. Oh, can I say one more thing? Please, anything you want. Tap aggregation. Oh, is really. It was a new thing for me. Didn't know about it. Started using it. Very cool. Now, everybody has So when you opinions. say tap aggregation, I've heard of taps, which are physical yeah. things. Like, so at my so, old job, we had taps, which would then feed into like packet collector stuff, right? Is that what? That's like, tap aggregation. Yeah. yeah. The, the actual protocol that I was learning was like how to do it on a switch. So you, if you have a lot of taps and you want to aggregate the data, you want to bring it all together. So why would you, don't you use have a physical many... tap instead of a, a mirrored port or whatever they call well, it? Like, 
Was the question why? Well, yeah, like can't you do the mm-hmm. same thing with a mirrored because port out of a switch? You can, but it doesn't use up switches resources, right. and it won't yeah. take up another port that you don't want it to take up. And if you have right, a lot right. of them for whatever reason, uh, it's just so much easier to have basically a dedicated switch that will connect all of those. You know, be be the like port density for it, and then that switch can just feed all of that aggregated tap data to like a PC or whatever. And the pro the the protocol that sets that up that's tap aggregation. So, do they switch. exist to capture traffic and put it into like a Wireshark and see what's going on? Is that yeah, the like the switch that you configure to be your tap switch basically has to be a dedicated tap aggregation switch. So you put it in like a mode called uh, I forget exactly like tap. Okay exclusive or something like that tap aggregation mode exclusive and you but is just, it like one port that comes out of that switch and then goes into the tap yeah you have basically? a tap ports and a tool port or multiple tool ports if you mm. want it's very easy setup you just specify which ports are the tap ports by giving them it uses 802.1 q tagging so it's just using the v it's not technically vlans but it's the exact same thing and place i think in the frame or whatever so um it, you just specify the tag and you name the like tool group and then you just tell the tool port hey send this tool group out just like you would like a a vlan trunk right and you connect that to your pc and it'll know like okay i'm gonna take the tap data from all these ports and send it out my port to the pc every time it comes in boom done i loved your video on it it was on tiktok right yeah yeah and there's different kinds of taps you can have passive taps which work for under gigabit speed. So if you're doing fast E stuff that you're tapping, that's you would use these passive taps, which just means they don't need to be powered. They don't need to do any extra stuff. A lot of people use like the throwing star land taps is what they're called. For gigabit speeds and higher, you need to have something that's actually powered and it's an actual like bigger device. But you can definitely put that in a rack and mount it and do whatever you want. Graphic. Mm-hmm. It's very cool. Troubleshooting stuff. Mm-hmm. <sighs> take take us home Andy. enough about tools me oh my god i wasn't prepared hold on i'm afraid to open a window give me a second <laughs> uh getting there vamp for a second would you yep that's it that was the vamping Wait. yep uh-huh. <laughs> I, I'm still. I have no idea what that means. Oh, vamp! Uh, like uh, talk for a while. I got it. Hold on. Oh, uh, oh I thought it meant like dance. Vamping. I thought that was like an e-cigarette or something. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Tim, Lex, it's been awesome talking about uh, all the troubleshooting and troubleshooting tools. And um, God, there's just so much to know and learn, and so many things that can go wrong in the network. So the more tools you have at your disposal better uh, equipped you are to do your job and prove it's not the network um thanks so much for listening to us you can find us on twitter at uh art of net eng or on instagram at the same handle art of net eng art of net eng on facebook on linkedin god we're everywhere uh our website's art of network engineering.com we have some new merch up on our merch store art of net eng.com forward slash store um also we have a discord study group which is fantastic there's like 5300 members i think in there now and you know if twitter's on your nerves because of all the things going on and you're looking for a community to join uh, that's at artofnetengcom forward slash iaatj which stands for it's all about the journey um do we have a mastodon is that something we're supposed to like we're going to okay we're so Alex is working on there. social all right, Everyone's so we'll be there and announce it when it's time. But... Exchange. <laughs> All right. Well, Tim, Lex, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, uh, everybody, for listening, for joining in. Thanks to the folks who joined uh, you know, the public room. And uh, as always, uh, we love talking tech and networking with you guys. And we'll see you next time on the net. Whoa, on the art of network engineering. Hey y'all, this is Lexi. If you vibe with what you heard us talking about today, we'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcatcher. Also, go ahead and hit that bell icon to make sure you're notified of all our future episodes right when they come out. 
If you want to hear what we're talking about when we're not on the podcast, you can totally follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Art of NetEng. That's Art of N-E-T-E-N-G. You can also find a bunch more info about us and the podcast at artofnetworkengineering.com. Thanks for listening.